The Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. Kev, I don't know what you started, but this um, with this box gate has got um, it's got very serious now within the uh, the Fuji Cast group, isn't it? Look at this. <laughs> Arno Dimling has. Uh, I thought I would weigh in on the Kevin Neal dispute about saving original boxes. I have for the longest time subscribed to Neil's philosophy and saved boxes to enhance future sale of equipment. Since I find myself conducting most of all my sales with MPB, uh, which he says show sponsor, yeah, not, not for this one, but for the other one, yes, I find that they never ask about original packaging. Well, mm, they don't ask, but they do like to get, Arno. Um, it's just that a lot of people don't, I think, a lot, this is going to go straight into your argument now, Kev, and so therefore they have to create their own boxes. See, now that, you see, if they had the original boxes, they wouldn't have to make their own boxes. I, this is a public announcement. <laughs> Uh, if if you keep boxes in your boxes of empty air yeah in your cupboard yes in your cupboard boxes and boxes and boxes that have nothing in them but air what's the point well the point is the (laughs) reason no (laughs) let's not go down there but it's quite funny look at this 38 comments so far and growing all the time I, I didn't realise people were quite so um, were, were were quite so rabid almost about about, about this subject of Pete whether Seager you sorted it out in 1954 <laughs> or whatever, oh, look, and he a, said little, little boxes. boxes made of ticky tack, <laughs> little boxes, little boxes, little boxes, all the same. There's a green one and a pink one and a blue one and a yellow one, and they're all made out of ticky tacky, and they all look. Just the same. That's like a book at bedtime. The Fuji cast. Well, there we go. Pete Seeger did indeed wrap it up. Um, <laughs> he foresaw this argument coming on the Fuji cast and he wrote a song about it called Little Boxes. So I think it's just going to go and go this one, isn't it? I think so. Anyway, welcome to the FujiCast. You and your questions from our electronic mailbag. And, of course, also through the FujiCast private Facebook group that we have uh, where you can join in with lots of debates about camera boxes. Um, If you're not a Fujifilm shooter, don't worry. It's a big community. Whatever flavour you shoot, you're very welcome. Send your questions in via there or via the email, as I said, to click at fujicast.co.uk. Thank you to our friends who are supporting us through Patreon. Uh, Kev's Book of the Week this week. Yes, this week I've got um, I've got Glasgow by Raymond Depardon. Okay, that's another one I I don't I don't think I'm very aware of. Mm, Okay, and uh, John Manel, the Portrait Per Day Man, who has been on the um, on on Photography Daily before. He's he's going to be here. I I think it's quite inspirational actually, John Manel, for various reasons. One of the reasons is that um, when we talk a bit about mental health, don't we, on this show? And uh, John suffered from. various conditions which made it really difficult for him to get out and, and make portraits on the street so he had to kind of force himself out there but that he he credits that very much with um with his re- recuperation i suppose um so john manel uh, portrait per day man is going to be on the show a, a little bit later on um easter isn't it easter day uh, easter monday isn't it easter day was yesterday easter, easter monday today if you're downloading on the right day in, and if of course you do observe easter not everybody of course who listens will observe easter but you do kev i know that i do indeed you yes mean- i mostly observe eating the kids eggs <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you know it does not seem since last year when we were having this conversation that i think you'd polished off rose's eggs or something and you, you'd you'd eaten the chocolate eggs before she'd even got to the cupboard well my mum this year obviously we haven't been able to see my mum in a hundred years but she she sent me money and she said look you're gonna have to get the kids eggs and uh this year don't eat them <laughs> before easter and then have to buy them again which is what we did last year myself and Gemma, we sat there one evening a bit hungry what can we eat (laughs) but you can only ever eat one kev can't you good god what it's chocolate you can eat it until it stops (laughs) yeah no i'd feel a bit guilty opening up more than one in the night no, no, no. I can open two Easter eggs with two hands. One, e- My left hand and my <laughs> right hand, I can open up them like instantly. Do you smash them on the floor first to make it a bit more interesting? I, 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 I like smashing them against my forehead. <laughs> <laughs> so I love Easter eggs. I love Easter. Easter is very important to me, yeah. But, but yeah, Easter eggs are uh, uh, wonderful things. <laughs> well, you went, you went to all the Sunday schools and I got chucked out of mine, obviously. 
Um, <laughs> what what is the significance of chocolate eggs? Uh, I don't actually know what the 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 bunny is. The, it's more to do with um, spring and like new life, and that's where the the bunny comes from, and you know right. the, the kind of chirping of new life. Presumably, Thorntons were involved, and you know all that kind of stuff, and then they made Easter eggs. Yeah. But yeah, I, like religiously, I don't know if we don't know if there's a connection. Might be. Don't it know. did sound a bit like an Eddie Izzard sketch then. There, it, is it, it was uh, it was thousand, thousand BC, and uh, along came Thorntons. Thorntons came along, and I thought, well, how can we uh, the coming of Christ and the chocolate eggs? <laughs> it's like Clinton, Clinton's, isn't it? Clinton cards. They yeah, they yeah. invented like Mother's Day and Father's Day and well, Children's uh, Day and it, all those other days. But that is true, isn't it? Some of that stuff. It is true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But no, think... I'm sure the East, I'm sure the Easter Bunny is is something to do with spring and fresh life. And you know, from yeah, from a religious point of view, I don't think there's there's much kind of uh, no. uh, connection. You know, no. but it's fun, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I do like an Easter egg. Like dunk it in my tea, an Easter egg. You're going to say that's a waste of time like boxes, nope. aren't you? No, no, I, I put chocolate anywhere. Hey, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. As long as it ends up in my mouth, it doesn't matter where it's been beforehand. <laughs> right, questions. Um, <laughs> uh, are you going first or me? I'll go first. Go on then. We've got one from Alex of Fredrickson, and this is from 14 weeks ago. So we haven't got to this. And she says, yada, 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 yada. We haven't done that for a while. Have we? Yada, yada, yada. No. Uh, and this is a two-part question about your wedding clients, uh, and in brackets, the couple. First of all, question part A, how important is it that you get to know them a little as people before the wedding? Okay, I'll get to part B in a second. So answer that first. How important is it that you get to know them a little as people before the wedding? We've had a discussion very similar to this where I mm. talked about a competitor <laughs> who uh, at a wedding fair had said, Neil, you're doing it all wrong. What I like to do, I like to take him out for a good old slap-up steak dinner. You won't be doing much of that at the moment, obviously. And I like to get to know them, find out about them. We hang around, we go to the pub, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, I wouldn't want to do any of that. Not because I don't want to spend time with my clients. And there are some clients you meet, Kevin, I'm sure you've met them where where you think, oh, I really like to be your friend, um, and uh, but but on the whole, no, I don't. I mean, there has to there's a professional relationship. I mean, portrait portrait photographers that photograph politicians, etc. Don't think, oh, I've got to become your mate first. Let's do a few slap up stakes, but before <laughs> before they go and do a portrait city. Can you imagine that Afkanda? <laughs> uh, you know you, you're dead right uh, funny enough though so i going up totally off random here but um i was watching a webinar with uh daniel meadows who we interviewed a few weeks ago last yeah. night yeah and he he showed an amazing little clip where he he was talking about when he went to photograph uh margaret thatcher and he had uh he had like 10 seconds away. You know what, what it was like to photograph yeah. Margaret Thatcher. She would never allow you to photograph her unless, you know, she told you where to stand, what to do. That's and, right. And yeah. Questions. Yeah, everything. right. Yeah. Anyway, so he, he managed to blag his way into the uh, into the cabinet room like for four minutes beforehand to to do some test shots because it was getting dark and he needed to test his flash and everything. So he took a, a handful of pictures of her handbag sat on the on the table there. <laughs> And didn't think, you know, didn't think anything of it. He sent the sent sent the film off to uh, to his lab, uh, to the news desk, who sent it off to the lab. Uh, and they and he said, you know, don't get rid of the the end end. Of, so he, he, what he was saying was like the first couple of shots and the, the the last couple of shots were usually like trash shots and test shots or you know end shots. And he said, right, just keep hold of those because uh, you know I'm interested in the light that I managed to get. Anyway, uh, he 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 got this picture of the, the handbag. And that handbag sold, or that picture sold all around the world, because they were they were like at those times like we've everybody just wants a picture of the handbag by itself, you know this famous <laughs> Margaret Thatcher handbag. Yeah. Uh, and he was like, oh, I just took a picture of that to test the lighting, but yes, I'll take the money. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, well, how much he made from that picture of the handbag? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, oh. good for him. But uh, but yeah, no, you're right in terms of you know kind of you're right you know what you said about portrait photographers and you know do they get to know each other and everything and i have become friends with some of my uh, my clients i have to say but but by and large uh you know generally it's a it's a transactional thing and, and you yeah. know, you're very polite to them and yeah. everything and then and they get on their way and 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 you get on your way yeah, but um, i wouldn't i wouldn't expect a client to want to be be my friend i'm sure they don't want to they they want me to turn up and do a job for them and uh and and do it to the best of my ability and and give them a, a memory to use a cliche but that's what it is show them their day and then that's it's job done yeah i have 
We, we have it's, kept in touch with a few. I mean, there was one couple, a lovely couple, that we used to go down to see in Whitstable and go and have a glass of white wine during the during the Whitstable Bay um, Oyster uh, Week. And that was always, always really nice. I haven't seen them for a, f- a few years now, but stuff like that's lovely. But I think on yeah. the whole, they, you know, this idea, I, I think most clients would run a mile if you said, come on, let's all go out. Yeah, let's do some chilling time. What? Yeah, yeah, I think I, you know, you have to weigh it up, don't you? I think, I mean, I, I there's some some people I've photographed that I've become, you know, classes relatively good friends, um, but yeah, by and large, not so many. Um, but the interesting thing of Alex's question is the second part, part B. Oh, right, ready? Strap yourself in. Warning, warning. I thought it deserved that. <laughs> Since we're all human beings and right. not machines, do you find yourselves making your own secret? judgment about their suitability <laughs> and whether they'll make it as a mister and wife now i observe I, them on the day i wonder well i know something about about us and our discussions <laughs> i wonder who's going to be the first one to crack under questioning here <laughs> Give me, okay the last word in your shot rant them rate them out of 10 no i can't do that because they <laughs> might well be listening <laughs> I mean, look, it's, it's a great question, though, isn't it? It's human nature. Since isn't? we're all human yeah. beings and not machines. Yeah, it is human nature. Look, I've shot, if it wouldn't have been for damn you, Corona, I would have shot 900 weddings by now. And um, it would be fair to say during that time, I will inevitably have met people, as you will meet people in everyday life and think, oh, how does that one work then? That's that's not unusual, is it? No, it's perfectly natural and and you know as we often say we're there as observers you know we're like the united nations of weddings we're there to to you know just kind of observe and and when you're observing you see things yeah and you know you see you see things that perhaps you shouldn't be seeing and and you make assumptions that perhaps you shouldn't be making i walked into a room once and saw something i certainly should not have been seeing (laughs) between two people that certainly should not have been doing what i was seeing that i thought i was seeing I'd like to think that all of my couples are, you know, are still together. But I know that's not true because one of them, I photographed his wedding three times. I, I had a similar situation, didn't I, a couple of years ago, yeah. where I turned up to shoot a wedding and um, I recognised the groom's uh, name, but I, I don't know why it, it, it had been years and years and years since the two weddings. I hadn't hadn't really. I thought well, there could be another guy called that, and. Um, when when I showed up to to photograph the wedding, sure enough, there he, the, and he kind of looked at me, and I looked at him, and I thought, "You have no idea you've booked me, do you?" <laughs> I kept suitably stum during the day. Yeah, very interesting. Mm. Right, your question. Okay, uh, from Greg Smith. Hi Neil. Hi Kev. You said you were after more questions on the show. This well, we are actually. Yeah, the email bag is like. I mean, look at it. Here it is. I've got it. If it was a filing cabinet, there'd be nothing in it. How are you doing with your Facebook ones, by the way? You've got lots there? Uh, yeah, we've got a handful. we still obviously mm. more. More more the better. More the better. Yeah. Keeps us going. Click at fujicast.co.uk. Otherwise, yeah, we, we always said that the day we run out, we'll just do a, well, that was fun, wasn't it, programme. Yeah, we'll run off. Yeah. So here, here's one for you both. Presented with the same subject. Oh, Kev, this could cause trouble. What? Would a man or woman photograph it differently? And if so, why? Best regards, Greg Smith of Huddersfield, who the, who runs off with a tin helmet on and waits for us to implode with this one. Mm. Wow. It, um, it's a tightrope walker, this one, because I do think that uh, women and men could photograph things, see things differently. Now, I'm not suggesting men don't have empathy, but I, I certainly see more empathy... Well, actually, in conflict photography, that there's a good example. I mean, I spoke recently to Marissa Roth. She did a project recently called uh, Women and War, um, One Person Crying. And the project is based on how war has affected women and culture. And, and I, th- I think it does make a difference that it was Marissa that photographed that and not Martin, just pulling an, an M out of the the ether i think it does i think it does make a difference yeah i i I tend to agree with you and 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 i don't think i don't know whether you can draw a line down kind of the the gender of people but generally everybody has 
different views of things, don't they? And they see things differently. But, uh, you know, yeah, you're right. We need to walk. It's a very, very narrow type careful, walk this is. Careful. <laughs> um, but I think you're right. I think generally females probably have a perhaps a more empathetic view of certain things. And, uh, you know, uh, ultimately, there's no difference. You both have two eyes, both have, you know, a camera in front of us. Yeah. And, you know, it's, uh, who was it that said, um, you know, the most important thing about a camera is the 12 inches behind it. And and that's that's it, isn't it? You know, it's yeah. it's what people see and what people interpret is very different. You know, stick an stick an orange on a table and ask ask a woman to take a picture of it. Stick an orange on a table and ask a man to take a picture of it. You know, yeah, you're going to get slightly different things, but yeah. it's interesting. And you know, I think I think it's good that that mm. everybody would would kind of approach it differently. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I don't I don't know if you can draw a line on gender though. To be honest with you, it's a little bit like saying, you know, would a child. Do you remember those, what was that program that used to be on Tea Time on Saturday night? Um, uh, kids, they'd ask them questions, you know. Oh, like, yeah. What did I, the dinosaurs ever do? And, you know, yeah. and then and the kids would answer the questions back. Yeah. And it was a yeah. wonderful program. Yeah. Why, why didn't they ever put things like that on TV anymore? Instead, they put things like The Only Way is Bloody Essex and shit <laughs> like that. You know, like proper nice programs they don't put on anymore. Um, but, you know, you, 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 see a, you see the world from a kid's, kid's point of view. Uh, and it's just wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And you know, the eyes—the eyes of the person taking the picture—is, you know, it's just different people. Yeah. Interesting question, Greg. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, do we have time for another one? Do you think one? we walked that tightrope <clears throat> well enough? <laughs> I think so. I think we we, we avoided great uh, great great issues. Uh, I think we, I nearly fell off towards the end. But, uh, <laughs> grabbed on. <laughs> yeah, I, I I was getting ready to send Gemma in there to to, to rescue you, to pull you out. Um. We have yes, we do have time for a couple more questions before before the interview today. So, Kev from the Facebook group, right? So, this is quite a long one. This is from Josia Bania, and says hello. So, last year before the lockdown, I bought an XT3 and 56 1.2 in hopes to start a portrait actor headshot business here in New York City. The plan went uh, the way everybody's did, but the past year it did give me a lot of time to research, practice, and learn. Now, the question. I keep encountering photographers online, even a photographer frequently mentioned on the show, mm -hmm, not mentioning any names, mm -hmm. who say that while they love the Fuji x mate system, they would never use it for professional studio portrait work. At this point, said photographers <laughs> typically mention resolution, color, and the benefits these confer on skin, ease of processing, <laughs> etc. Indeed, the vast majority of Fuji X photographers who make portraits seem to be doing so almost exclusively with the GFX system. In light of all this, I can't help but wonder if the tools I have, which I must say I love and are perfect for many applications, are the right ones for this particular job. Mm. I haven't drunk the in commas, full frame is better Kool-Aid. No. But I am curious to know both of your thoughts on whether full frame or medium format may sometimes be more appropriate than crop sensor in professional studio portrait environments. If so, or not, <laughs> how or why, and in what circumstances, in your own experiences? Question mark. It's like one of those big sort of uh, <laughs> things you got at school that then just said, discuss at the, at the end 50 yeah i haven't word finished essay. yet oh, it goes no, on to say more. love your show very much oh, i'm wishing you both right. and to all of us a very prosperous year oh well, that's very <laughs> kind um yeah well look i'm straight away out off the off the bat with this one matt porteous comes to mind because of course he um he loves the gfx system and he uses it in the studio Plus, he also said that if he, if he could, if he could, he would put it in a water housing and take it under the water, didn't he? But it was the 12K figure that was just preventing him. Because I think for the Canon 5D, which he uses um, under for his underwater stuff, it's um, he's he's actually, um, I think he's got some sort of ready-made housing that's that's half the price. But but otherwise, he'd be using it, wouldn't he? Yeah, I think so, and and it does drive me nuts. I have no idea who, uh, which photographer uh, Josio is thinking about. He says regularly mentioned on the show, but right. there obviously is one. Um, it does. It, it is a little bee in a bonnet of mine for you know. The, 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 there's a there's a history of people who align themselves with brands, not necessarily Fujifilm. I've seen it with all brands, and you know they 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 kind of 
get their ambassadorship, they, they get their promotions, they get their <laughs> workshops and stuff, and actually they do their day job with something else. And, you know, that, that does drive me nuts. But the, you know, the fact, the, the raw fact of it is if you are doing, uh, I'm not even going to use the words high-end portraiture, but if you're doing portraiture that uh, demands high pixel resolution, high print resolution, then yes, the GFX is better. But GFX is only, what well, GFX 50 is only two and a half years old. So 50 megapixels, there's full frame sensors that have 50 megapixels. You know, it's, it, it, there's, a, there's a lot of snobbery that kicks around in, in the industry. And, you know, I've seen, you know, Wayne Johns, for example, he, he yes, he uses GFX now, but only until the GFX came along. And of course, he's going to use GFX now. Why not? Uh, up until then, he shot all of his professional, brilliant, beautiful portraiture, commercial work with the APS-C sensor. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't, I don't really don't think. I think, you, you know, when it, uh, the only thing that really kind of, uh, in my mind, I think is relevant is, is kind of size of the final product. And, you know, the, you know if it's going to be on a, I don't know, the cover of Vogue, for example, it will be better to shoot it on GFX, but it doesn't mean it has to be. And until GFX came along, medium format came along, it certainly didn't have to be in terms of the Fujifilm world. So, yeah, I mean, Kool-Aid, full frame is better. No, it's not, in my mind. Uh, Kool-Aid, yeah, they, there's an element of that, you know. Uh, I think that, you know, people people think they're cool with different cameras and stuff, and that's yeah, well, fine. You know, I also think it's, it's, it's what you feel comfortable with. I mean, you know that I shoot with two systems, and sometimes I feel more comfortable with one than the other one. But, I mean, I, I've shot successfully, I like to think, with both systems. Um, and it is how you feel at the time. I remember... Well, particularly when I was sporting the, uh, the, I had a bag with X Pro twos in them, and a bag with uh, with Canon five D um, would have been three, I think threes in them, and um, when I was I was shooting a bit more abroad at the stage uh, at that at that stage and travelling a bit more, and I I used to make my decision based on what would actually work with me for my travel rather than the camera itself. It, it was a tool more more so than. Um, than anything I was particularly in love with as as a box to use. I've I've not got quite. I'll, I'll admit that I'm not quite so passionate about the box as you are, Kev. Um, no, I but think, you know what? I'm just uh, no. I, I I I totally agree about everything you just said, apart from boxes. No, I don't the, mean that sort of box. I mean the, bo no, I know, the I actual know. camera. <laughs> uh, I know. Um, <laughs> you know, right? So I just typed into Google out of interest, iconic Vogue covers. Right. Okay. Yeah. So 21, the 21, uh, 21 landmark British Vogue covers, right? First one, 1916, uh, 1932, 1945, 1947, 1950, 1961, 1962, 1966, 1967, uh, that was Twiggy, uh, photographed by Ronald Traeger, 1967, and we're in 1970, um, Elton John, we got 1976, which was uh, actually wasn't a picture, it just said Diamond Jubilee, 1916, 1976, oh, did it? Okay. Uh, love the Queen, 1976, uh, 1981, then we skipped to 1981, uh, the soon-to-be Princess of Wales, 20-year-old Lady Diana Spencer was photographed by Lord Snowden oh, yeah. for the August 1981 cover, the release of which coincided with the wedding of Prince Charles, 29th of July, 1981. Uh, there we go, 1981. And then there, obviously there's more. Then we go on to 1990, Peter Lindbergh's iconic picture, now iconic picture um, uh, of Naomi Campbell and, and some of the models. Uh, I can't I, you know, I can't read all their names, there's loads of them. And then we've got 93, Kate, Kate Moss. Uh, 1999, we're at 1999. Now we're at the year 2000. We're at number 16 out of 21. Um, now we hit 2016. So we've gone from the year 2000 to 2016. We've got Duchess of Cambridge. And uh, then we're on number 18 out of 21, 2017. And then we hit 2019. And then we hit September 2019. So two in 2019. And then number 21 out of 21 is June 2020. Judy Dench. Oh, isn't she ace, isn't she? Judy Dench is British Rogues, June 2020 cover star, and its oldest to date. The 85-year-old actor was styled by Kate Phelan and photographed by Nick Knight shortly before the coronavirus crisis struck. Now, uh, Nick Knight, perhaps, probably, in almost certainty, shot that with some kind of 
medium format, may have shot it with a medium format film, whatever, doesn't matter. But June 2020, compared to whoosh, going right the way back up my uh, up my browser thing to 1990, 1950, uh, you know, we've got a picture there by Irving Penn. Yeah. You know what? Who cares? So, yeah, everybody would have had a different piece of equipment. That's what yeah. you're saying, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, we all, you know, listen, I've got a GFX 100 and, and you know, and I and I, I like it. I use it. It's, it. It does do things for me that my APS-C sensor can't do. But that doesn't mean that uh, somebody with a, you know, can't go and produce a vote cover with yeah. an APS-C sensor. Well, I'm, I'm going to, it won't be APS-C, it's going to be a GFX sens- uh, sensor. But, Miss Anne, I'm going to add one onto yours because you didn't mention... Um, Miss Anne Harriman, uh, who uh, who shot the Vogue, uh, British Vogue, first actually first black uh, male photographer to shoot a British Vogue cover in the magazine's 104 history. Um, that portrait was made with a GFX, by the way. Now, why isn't that? What, so that should be in the most in the 21 most iconic pictures of uh, Vogue cover. It's not there. Anyway, I think point points made. Yeah, point made. Uh, Jonathan Crilly. Hi, Neil. Hi, Kev. Heard your uh, shout out uh, for questions on the show. Here we go. Given the emergence now of the vaccines, um, uh, getting back to normality in some sense uh, in summer, autumn, how will your approach to commercial wedding photography change once once we get out the other side? Will you, for example, take a more diversified approach? Would you encourage others so that your income stream is not reliant upon a single income stream like weddings? Thanks for the good work from Jonathan. Um, Yeah. I was, I was chuckling the other day with somebody who said, "Have you had any after effects to the, um, to the, uh, to the, uh, to, to the AstraZeneca one?" I said, "No, but it's very funny, you know, with all that Bill Gates flowing around in me. I've got this really funny side effect. I want to smash up anything that belongs to Apple." <laughs> I've had that for years. <laughs> I said, years, well, years, years. And that's exactly what I said to this person. <laughs> my co-host, my mate Kev, has got that, and he's not even had the vaccine yet. <laughs> Uh, will your approach change? I don't know. I'm, I mean, in, in terms of diversifying, oh, most certainly, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, we both diversified massively. I think you know, we've, and we wouldn't, we've both we done wouldn't different things. Done, we wouldn't have done perhaps to to the same degree had this not happened. This has well, kind of forced forced my hand, certainly. Well, listen, you know, today is you know, we're of course it's Easter Monday in in the real world when you're listening. Yeah. Perhaps if you're yeah. listening on Easter Monday, but yeah. it, you know, in our world, it's it's the first of April, <laughs> and um, today, yesterday was year end for me. I don't know about your year end, but my year end is. 31st of March, and, and I wrapped up my, uh, my my sorry, my Facebook is Lee Glasgow. If you're listening, Lee, stop messaging me during recording of the <laughs> he podcast. He won't know how to do this. He's, he's going to be listening four days hence. I know, he yes. Be, he shouldn't be talking about... For the future. Should anyway, be, yeah. so my, my um, I did my, my final P&L, and my entire income from weddings, from wedding photography, for the entire financial year, 1st of April 2020 to yeah. the 31st of March 2021 was... To Bob 10. Almost <laughs> £2,590. Yeah, goodness. <laughs> yeah, £2,590 from weddings for an entire year. It's, uh, it's, that's quite eye-opening, isn't it? It is, very much. And, and, and that is only partly because I had a, a uh, that wedding we did in um, Switzerland um, back in the day. That, that kind of payment came through then. Otherwise, I think it would have been pennies, nothing. Wow! No deposits, and nothing. nothing. Um, so yeah, we, we you know we've we've had to we've had to do different things. You know, we I, I you know I don't think I don't think it's a, a secret that you know taking bounce back loans and various things like that. But mm. we've you know done done stuff. I, you know, you've done um, the photography daily. You've done some video stuff. You've done some um, corporate work. Well, that's that's, that's where I happened. That's why I plan to be coming out the other side. Yeah, well, I think you'll have to diversify. I think once upon a time, it was very much the consideration was, oh, you know, f- specialise in something. You'll, you know, you'll if you can specialise in that, you'll sort of really build a, a good, strong base for yourself. Don't sort of spread yourself too thin. But an element of of thin spreadage uh, has actually been quite good for some for some photographers who who've been able to. Well, if that part of the business is not working, I'll go do that part. Well, it's really interesting because I, I, you know, I feel like it's taught me a lot of lessons. I have to say, 
and you, you, yes, of course, I'm, I still class myself as a wedding photographer and, you know, I will come the end of June and be, be photographing weddings again. But it's definitely taught me that some things come and sideswipe you. You get hit over the head by things that, that just, you know, it's that, that eggs in baskets thing, isn't it? You know, you, if you have all your eggs in one basket, you're in trouble. And, uh, you know, I think that's, there's lessons learned there. Yeah. Thank you for your, your question. Um, right. Time to uh, speak to John Manella, I think. Uh, based in Penge in South East London, John is a growing, uh, well, one of a growing number of photographers I've spoken with personally who use their time behind the lens to actively treat conditions such as stress, uh, depression and severe anxiety. Mental health, particularly during this time, has been an important conversation in our world. And by that, I mean photography and I suppose really as, as an extension, the, the arts in general. John's work is on Instagram and his website, both of which we'll link to in the show notes today, shows the, the incredible journey uh, that John has made personally. This is John Manel. In these strange times, as has become the, the, the go-to phrase uh, for prefacing any, any conversation during this period in history, John, I've been talking much about mental health to everybody and anybody who'd listen. It's, it's an opening gambit, it seems, when I start an interview, but genuinely, I, I mean it when I ask, how are you and how has this time been been for you um i'm very well thank you um it's not been an easy time but it, it certainly hasn't been an easy time for anybody i think we've had a lot of people around us that have had a very very unfortunate experience in in lockdown loss of family friends um even one poor friend whose house even burnt down and is currently homeless oh, so word. and um that sounds um, quite an extreme circumstance but that combined with covid means insurers and everything's been delayed so when you compare it to how we've been it's been tough but we count ourselves very very lucky i know that you describe yourself as um well early back in your school experiences as the the quiet and shy kid in the corner and you'd you didn't much care for larger groups of people but you were happy you were happy with it but it was a it was a stomach operation that was a catalyst to start to turn shyness into a some something a lot more difficult to cope with wasn't it can you can you tell me about that yeah so um i think perhaps i've always had issues with anxiety but it was quite often confused with shyness um and back several years ago i had a a rare stomach disease which meant i was rushed into hospital and uh, was in and out of hospital for uh, 11 months in total with quite long periods at home but it was just a recurring issue I went from being extremely fit to not being able to carry a shopping bag having to use walking sticks wow. Um, wow. and then even when I didn't need the walking sticks I actually carried them as a visual aid through fear of people bumping into me so it was just a way to sort of keep my own little space and the mental effects on that, which I never actually accepted or dealt with, just slowly got worse and worse to the point that I found it very tough to to get outdoors. Um, Did you become ag agoraphobic as such? Yeah, um, it was a fear of fear of people bumping into me. Um, just lost confidence in in that everyday life, the things that you just take for granted, popping into a shop. Um, brushing past someone to get on the tube or anything like that it just become a little bit more challenging did, did people um I, i'm sort of rewinding a little bit to school but but i, I remember a time uh, in my own um, school career if you like where where you know you'd, you'd always recognize a shy kid in the corner and and people would say oh just pull yourself out of it things have changed slightly though haven't they um i was very lucky that at school i mean i was always sound performance difficult so I loved being creative I could never find myself on stage so yeah, yeah. um for example I had a fantastic drama teacher um who I feel like I still have to call him Mr Price um, <laughs> but he he recognized my love for for the arts really so yeah. he would encourage me to help do set design and and I'd I do think children are far more aware of mental health. So how did this all eventually manifest? We're sort of fast-forwarding again, really. You've had the operation. You've you've sought out some help. You recognised that you needed help. But um, eventually it led to photography being a possible key, didn't it? But but it, actually, it wasn't as if photography was new to you, though. It was it was something that was kind of reintroduced, wasn't it, as part, as part of your, I'm going to call it therapy. Yeah. Um, so quite funny, really, my... Even today, my lack of planning sometimes can be shown. But back at school, me and a few friends um, 
absolutely love the film Clerks by Kevin Smith. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, um, black and white film. And we thought we would be clever and go study it outside of school. So sort of Googled or probably asked Jeeves at the time, whatever it would have been. Yeah. Um, night courses in black and white film, not realising that by film it meant 35 mil film and not moving image. <laughs> we signed ourselves up for a two-year course in black and white film. Um, and I think from the moment you see that first image appear in the dev tank, um, you kind of get hooked. So do, yeah. the love was always there, but just as you grow older sometimes, you your hobbies shift, your priorities change, and I sort of left it to the wayside for, for several years, really. And it wasn't until I had some quite incredibly incredible group therapy on the NHS um, with, of course, a CBT as well, um, that the woman recognised I was creative and a very easy way for her to get me outdoors and completing tasks, which I could write down how I felt in sort of like a thought diary or I think that was what we referred to it as was was to go and take pictures um, and with a digital camera, the bonus is the results are instant. Yeah. So you can get quite a positive an instant reward from from taking what you think is a good photo. So, yeah, sev- several year gap, but quite amazing how that passion was kind of found by this therapist, really. So, yeah. was it was it the therapist's idea, portrait per day, or or, or had you sort of reinvigorated your, your photographic interest and you came up with the concept? Well, it, the the concept of portrait per day inadvertently goes to my wife Catherine um she probably regrets it now (laughs) so her concept was to go out and take photos it would be landscapes or street art I'd often go out when streets were quieter um because that was what I felt more comfortable with yeah and then I moved on to joined a couple of night courses again uh, this time a bit more research and doing (laughs) black and white film and then there was sort of governmental cuts which classified photography not as a vocational career subject to study which meant it lacks funding so every year the courses got more expensive and as people dropped off the course um, they couldn't validate running them and in the final year I wanted to do portrait photography which I never got the chance to so my wife Catherine suggested why don't you do your own project probably meaning go take 10 or 12 portraits but (laughs) It, it, it led to the concept of Portrait Per Day, which was 365 portraits in 2017. And I've sort of carried it on. I don't do it every day, but I do try to actively get out and take portraits nearly every day I can. I'm perplexed as to how you even found the strength to ask strangers for portraits, because um, most most people would find that a truly horrific um, ordeal. A lot of street photographers um, say, you know, the reason why they don't, um, take a lot of pictures of people is because they're frightened to ask them for for permission for portraits. You strode out though with with your stress, <laughs> with your anxiety, with the depression problems, and purposefully chose to to take the hardest route. Why? It's funny that you say it's the hardest route though, because I've got I admire street photography's ability to take portraits without permission, to take candids or to because again probably something that a lot of people with anxiety have is where you just uh, catastrophize a situation. Yeah. I just can, I have this vision in my head of taking a photo without permission of someone confronting me. Oh, right. So for me, I find that terrifying. So to go and ask someone, what's the worst that, you know, it took me a long while to be able to process this, but really what's the worst that could happen in, is them say no. And often when they say no, you still have a, a nice conversation anyway. You started to ask people at night time, as you said, as you suggested, you did it late at night, which I would imagine is the harder time of the day to do it because people are thinking, look, it's night time. I don't want to be approached by a stranger asking me for a photograph. Yeah, it's, um, that in itself can be quite funny and lead to different conversations. You, you often get applauded for asking someone at night. It's quite funny because you're breaking them out of their everyday habits as yeah, well. Yeah. But it, you do get such positive responses and nice stories. And you mentioned Gabrielle um, previously, and you've, you've had a nice chat with Gabrielle. Yeah, Gabrielle Matoli, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's absolutely fantastic. But if you talk to her one-on-one, I don't think you would ever realise the genuine issue she has with social anxiety. And I think that's what can be beneficial especially when you take street portraits is what you see on the surface isn't always what the person's feeling so Mm -hmm. I can still go up to someone 
and be nervous inside, yet actually to them I probably appear a relatively confident person asking for a portrait. Isn't it interesting, though, you said that you found acting and you, you, you opted really for behind-the-scenes work, when actually you're a good actor. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if I'd ever be called, <laughs> if you went back to um, certainly my musical performances at school um, and things on stage, I certainly wouldn't get applauded for acting but still even even talking to you I mean I've relaxed now but yeah. beforehand you just get nervous because you feel like it's a, not a performance if you like but yeah, you, yeah. I just that whole uh, something being kept to be judged does does sometimes just make me feel nervous um, but I think you learn as well how to treat anxiety and that was part of what CBT did um, I now often process when I feel nervous or anxious um, I look at it as I'm pushing myself outside of my comfort zone, which is usually a positive thing. So you learn to process that when you are feeling anxious, not necessarily to to close up, but to, to take stock of what you're doing and look at what the positive thing is, the positive act is that you're doing. So I've sort of learned to teach myself really sometimes that when you are anxious, is the reason you're anxious is because you're doing something good. Yeah. That's and that, that does allow me to move forward. So the CBT, yeah. is, the CBT is cognitive behavioural therapy, isn't it? Are you, are you still doing it? No, um, I guess you kind of do it as a subconscious act. But when you reach a situation, um, and again, a lot of people with social anxiety or just anxiety in general, they do catastrophize. So you, initially, when you do it, you write how you feel. So one of my phobias was people could actually tell that I was suffering from anxiety and depression so if someone looked at me I would in my head process that's what they're doing and then I'd feel ashamed and then you would sort of write a score of how that made you feel and then you write the alternate situation on a piece of paper right. what they might have been thinking yeah. you know quite often if you've got a camera hanging around your neck you can say well they were probably looking at the camera because they like photography that might not be what they were thinking but you can change your perception of it and then eventually the, these processes just become habitual you don't hold on to that negative that that person's looking at you and judging you and the fact is that no one can often tell that someone's suffering from mental health so that fear i had that they can just look at me and tell that i was struggling um and even though it's nothing to be ashamed of that's what i used to feel well let's talk about the project then portrait per day as i said it starts 2017 and you chose instagram um for for uh, the platform for this it seems an obvious choice adding instagram but go on tell, tell me why just in case there's a less obvious reason well i don't really i still wouldn't always refer to myself as a photographer if you like because mm. um instagram back in 2017 doesn't have didn't have as much of the negativity associated to it that it has now. Um, for me, it was free. Um, I had always used Flickr previously to share photos, but people didn't, um, unless you were a photographer a lot of the time. Um, so it was a widely used platform that was very easy to and instant. The fact that people were using it, it was just such an obvious choice. Um, but I certainly don't see all of the negatives that people do see because I don't do it for a commercial use. Um, and I think that's when it becomes different. But, but for me, it's, you know, I don't claim to be a fantastic photographer. It, it's a passion. And, it you know, I guess a bit like they say, if you've got an infinite number of monkeys um, and typewriters, they write the works of Shakespeare. I kind of, my <laughs> approach to portraits is much the same. If I take an infinite number, I'm bound to get a few good ones. Well, I think you're being a bit, and, uh, bit harsh on yourself there. <laughs> <when> I... <laughs> well, um, I do get the odd fighter that I'm very proud of, and I yeah, think yeah. that's the rewarding nature of, of the process. Um, but, yeah, Instagram was an obvious one. I can, can see myself continuing to use it for that, and unless another platform comes along that does help. But, yeah. Well, I don't, I don't want to project what I think you should be proud of because it's not my project, it's your project. <laughs> but but one, one of the things that I can see that uh, has really come out of it is your interaction with, with people. I mean, people, uh, never mind the photograph, they've been frankly incredible, haven't they, some of these people that you met, and the stories. I read that, I mean, I, I've done some research on you, watched some films, read, read a lot of stuff now. <laughs> I mean, you've had people cry on you, you had somebody almost beat up on you because they didn't understand what the project was about. I think yeah. you thought you were trying to chat up his girlfriend or something. So you, you, yeah. you've, had, you've had these extraordinary interactions with people. What, what's it done for you? 
it's made me much more reflective of myself. I've always thought I'm a person that doesn't hold stereotypes or judge people for how they appear. But I've learned that I, I hold those a lot more than I think sometimes we'd like to convince ourselves that we do. Um, some of the photos, one of my favourites is, is a guy called Paul, which was walking along with his two Rottweilers. Um, looks quite an intimidating guy. Um, but he asked why I did the project. And then I told him, similar to telling you, like my backstory. And the first thing he did was just put his arm around me and just said, are you okay now, though? Oh, and it wow. was so <laughs> genuine and warm. But I love the, the stories and the intricacies you learn of where, I mean, because most of my photos now are taken in Penge, but I, I take my camera everywhere I am. So it, it could be a photo from when I'm at work or it could be from when I'm in my hometown. But you, you create this amazing overlay to where you live, all these great stories. Um, just the other night, I've not shared the photo yet, but took a photo of our local street cleaner and Mick, but his story of how appreciative, appreciative he is of how he got there. He years ago didn't have a lot and got basically a small bit of help from the Samaritans to help him get going. And without that, he wouldn't be where he is. And he lives next to the McDonald's on Pench High Street, right. and he cleans those streets to nearly 10 o'clock at night. But he loves the area and the streets that he lives on. And now knowing that that's who cleans my streets, every time I go past, I'll talk to him. I think because when I was at uni, we, we, we looked at this phrase called palimpsest, which is like parchment paper. So when you when you look at something on the surface, it can there's a, a lot of scratches below the surface so on a parchment paper you can get the scripts which were written before and it's very much of how I look at when I take photos you you can see the town on the surface for what it is but if you actually delve and look at it in detail you find all these beautiful stories which are hidden and you just become connected to, to a place through that it's, it's quite amazing really Our thanks to John Manell and you can see his work on his website and Insta linked through the show notes of course if after today's show you need uh, a little more, I suppose you could call it, podcast therapy, I'll be talking with Mark Wilson, whose project and photo book, A Wounded Landscape, Bearing Witness to the Holocaust, takes a very difficult subject and talks about it, I think, in a new way. It's an extraordinary and very personal story, and very much a story, too, about Kickstarter book projects, as this is one very considerable success story of that method in which photographers are bringing their books to market. If you have a book in you, it's worth hearing what he has to say. Then Wednesday, Mike Kelly talks about architectural photography, video conferencing photography, and a really clever project called Classified, shot at NASA's assembly factory. Photography Daily is available wherever you get your podcasts, just like this one, Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays. Right, back to your questions. Um, shall I start with one? Yeah, why not? Jonathan Kerr. Penny for your thoughts, chaps. Earlier this year, oh, well, this would have been just at the end of last year, maybe, a question was asked about the future of digital camera technology. And from memory, Kev referenced 5G connectivity and auto uploads and syncs to the cloud. While not checking all the boxes, the new-ish now, Zeiss ZX1, seems to be a step in this general direction. Um, while it seems to be aimed at photographers very much on the go, more so than working pros, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this piece of kit. Specifically, number one, built-in... Well, well, there's three points, so we'll take one at a time. Number one, built-in Lightroom editing capability. Do you like that idea? Mm, no. Why not? I, I, I just thought about that. No. For what reason? I, I don't know. I think it's a little bit lazy, isn't it? I, I mean, it depends what they mean by built-in. I don't want to be sat looking at the back of a two-inch LCD trying to do curves and editing and things like that. But the point being about, you know, automating editing and clouding it and being able to run presets or actions, as they as they used to call it in the Photoshop world. I'm, I'm just, I've just typed it in, Zeiss ZX1. Does it look nice? Nice-looking camera, yeah. yeah. Clean, straightforward user interface. Minimal distraction. It yeah. says, uh, and then it does say, "Edit. Make the most of your images with integrated Adobe Photoshop Lightroom, mm. intuitive multi-touch navigation at the extra large display, four point three inches." Okay, fair enough. Free up to focus on the job in hand. Well, the, mm. sec the second point was Wi-Fi only and not five G mobile uploads to the cloud. 
Uh, I don't know. I, th- I think there's no step back if you just because you're always looking for Wi-Fi, um, 4G, 5G, whatever. That that's what you want to be uploading to the cloud, isn't it? I guess so. I mean, I, I would say that 5G is the y- yeah. you know we, we all we all remember the flip from well, I remember the flip from kind of H mm. to E to Edge to to to. 2G or whatever it was, and then 4G. When 4G came along, it was like, "Whoa, my God, that's amazing!" Mm-hmm. But it did seem to take an eternity. But uh, we'll, you know, we'll get to 5G eventually, and and that. But 5G, by this, by you know, by all uh, shakes of the imagination, I think is is basically like high speed broadband, isn't it? Down your phone. So you uh, you won't need to get an extra broadband line if you want to have a standby line with somebody. You just have five just tether it to your phone then wouldn't you really? yeah i don't know i yeah. don't know i mean it's the, the point being that i think that you know cameras generally myself this is my own personal thoughts i i can't see what they do next you, you know yes the pixel generation game will continue and you will get bigger um pixel sensors and and you also will get the same that people say well you know pixels don't matter it's all about the art and and yes that's that's very true also but at the end of the day, pixels do matter depending on what you're printing to and display in and all that mm. kind of stuff. But, you know, technology, where does it go next? It has to be about connectivity and and, and all of that stuff, I think. You know, who yeah. who doesn't want to be able to take a picture and, and have it in your Dropbox and edit it in Photoshop via an action by the time you get home? I think that'd be ace. Well, th- this next one, I, I know what I feel about it, and I think you're, you'll have similar thoughts, maybe for different reasons, though. Replacing, uh, third and final one, replacing memory cards with an internal SSD. <laughs> <laughs> That's me having a little heart attack. <laughs> why, why does that trouble your little heart so much? Well, because what happens when your camera has to go to repair? Yeah. What happens when your camera breaks? What happens when the little mechanical thing inside that drives the internal SSD stops working? Yeah. With a memory card, you can swap it out. You Absolutely. can grab another camera. You can yeah. fit it in. You yeah. can, you know, you get another camera when it goes on when it goes to repair. Yeah. All of that stuff. I also thought actually of another thing. Um, what happens if a camera gets stolen? And, and, and yeah. I, I often think about this. When I'm doing late night, it wasn't so long ago. So maybe two Christmases ago, I did. Um, I did a late package wedding at the Ritz and um, was walking back and the car was parked. There's an underground car park near the other the other end of, of that. What's that road called, Kev, that the Ritz is on? Anyway, um, at the other end of the road, there it's is... It's on a, the end of Oxford Circus. No, no. Al Mal. No, uh, Piccadilly. That's it. Um, so on the other end of that, there's, there's an underground car park anyway. I was going to the underground car park and a group of lads were coming the other way. They did not have a car in that car park, uh, but they were coming the other way, and they started to started to talk to me. And I thought, no, no, no. It's like 12.30 at night. I'm thinking, no, thank you. This is not the time. It, w- it was really quite unpleasant. And if it weren't for the fact that another couple of people just happened to turn up behind me and they were going to get their cars as well, I wondered what might have happened. But I do remember feeling to my pocket and thinking, right, my well, wedding cards are here. So if I have to give my cameras away, mm. oh, they'll take that prize and I won't get a pasting and the wedding will still be safe. See, I was thinking about my couples. I love them. Yeah. Um, and and that, that sort of situation too. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. Um, although I suppose the people who... <laughs> <laughs> the people who used to say that petrol cars and diesel cars were the way forward, and now we're going to electric. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Same thing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But, but yes, I, I, I ultimately will probably end up in that in in that world. But um, yeah. hopefully, there'll be redundancy and and kind of systems in place to stop those kind of things happening. Or, or have a card in there as well. Yeah. Well, that was that was the thing that I suggested. Hmm. You know, have your internal SSD, but also also have a, uh, a replacement card. You yeah. know, one of the yeah. things I suggested to uh, to Fujifilm was stick a, a 512 gig uh, micro SSD built into the camera, but also have a, uh, you know, a, a card slot. Then best of both worlds, you know. The problem being is that you, you plug the camera into the, to the computer via USB, and yeah, USB-C is quick, but it's not that quick. You know, so you still have all of that, those issues. And, you know, uh, I think... 
that's the way technology is probably going to go. But who knows? You know, who knows? I don't know. Maybe they'll just bring out a, a blue camera or something, and everybody will love that. <laughs> a blue camera. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, right, right. Book of the week time, Kev. What, yes. What do we have from Kev's bookshelves? We have uh, Glasgow by Raymond Depardon. Right. Uh, Raymond Depardon being a uh, French photographer. Mm. This book, I've had this book for a long time, and, and I've checked. Even though I think last week I said I was going to go find, dig into my archives and find one that was more difficult to find, yeah. uh, I didn't because this is still highly available on Amazon. Yeah. And there's a wonderful, wonderful, I think it's on Vimeo or YouTube. I will put it in the uh, show notes. Um, kind of photo film, if you like, uh, still set to music yeah. of this book uh, or some of the stills from this book. It is one, it's, it's proper kind of, it's all color and it's, you know, early seventies, kind of late seventies, early eighties, that kind of time in Glasgow, late sixties, even Glasgow being, you know, quite a, uh, certainly the East end of Glasgow, quite a, um, you know, rundown area at those times. And the, the pictures honestly look like uh, some of them look like they could have been in Eastern Europe after the war. You know, we have this, beautiful pictures of these these two little girls um you know playing on the street with a with a pram a pretend pram there's no doll in the pram um but they're just playing with it and they're you know they're covered in mud and muck and and what i really love about it is the simplicity of the pictures but the color is is really incredible in that most of the the photo books on that generation typically seem to be black and white and, you know, there's, again, it's a book with no um, page numbers, mm. but, you know, I'm kind of like a third of the way through and I'm looking at this wonderful picture of a, a uh, fenced off garden. And in the garden is uh, a Jack Russell barking, a little girl doing a handstand. In the background is a couple of caravans and then these two huge tower blocks, um, you know, Glasgow tower blocks. And then you have the old, uh, what would you call them, brownstone type, buildings you know you, the, that, gla- that kind of stonework glazed brick thing uh yeah maybe i don't know it's it's i don't know there's probably a name though right. we'll just get ourselves in trouble if we get it wrong but murray mcmillan will tell us i'm sure but it's <laughs> it, you know it's 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 a very traditional looking stonework for for, for scotland at least right. and yet, you know you've got people like washing lines so many washing lines in this book how many of us have taken pictures of our washing line do you remember when you were a kid when you were a child growing up mm. your mum and dad Hanging out the washing. Oh, we right? always always had a washing line. We had a, Didn't we have had a, one of those spirally things no. that you know that kind of comes no. up and down and you know kind of stores itself. Oh, far it too was, posh. No, 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 we had exactly. a long, long it was two, line. It was two big sticks yeah. with a with a piece of string between them. Oh, you put the one in the middle just to keep it all up. Exactly, yeah. exactly that. You you know you stick one in the middle, keep it all up. You hang your underpants and your tea towels and all that kind of stuff on it. Who? How many of us took pictures? Of, well, obviously not us, but taking pictures of things like that and it, it, it's literally people sat underneath their washing lines having a, having a cigarette and maybe a drink <laughs> yeah, yeah and this is where nostalgia is built isn't it these kind of things i mean the picture i'm looking at now is a woman she's got one of those yellow <laughs> uh washing baskets we all had made of plastic broke after about a week you know they would splinter and you'd, you'd cut your fingers on them and the bomb would come off uh you know you you get them for a quid down pound land and uh, <laughs> She's there. She's just folding a shirt up. Uh, and now I look at that. I look at that basket and I think, my God, my mum and dad had hundreds of them. Yeah. And we got through hundreds of them. Yeah. Red ones, blue ones, yellow ones. And, you know, and she's got them. I tell you what, though, in fairness, those shirts are very well ironed. Oh, not ironed. She's taking them off the line, but they're very well pressed. Um, and then, you know, we have all of the uh, very iconic pictures um it's not all si- not all 60s though is it i mean some of these are 70s i mean yeah can, yeah it's it's that yeah. kind of generation yeah, 60s can, through to early you know, 80s date, I think. you can date often i date uh pictures by the cars there's an old red i think this is a Vauxhall viva i think it is mm. um and there's a, a brown r registration original r registration mini yeah it's a really really beautiful book and uh, i think for those of you who were uh you know from glasgow you will probably already have come across this book but for those of you that haven't uh, you know check it out and also and like i said i will i will link to the to the film because we're seeing these pictures set to um uh, set to glasgow chat and glasgow music oh not glasgow music but glasgow chat and music it really is amazing 
and and the the iconic pictures, which are probably the most famous pictures from uh, Raymond Depperton's kind of stuff from this generation, is the boys with the bubble gum. Mm. So uh, you know, you've got this great big purple bubble gum. Uh, hubba Bubba, probably. Oh, I've seen him, yeah. yeah, blowing it. I could never huge, do that. Huge I could never do that. Gums. It always used to explode before it got very long. Yeah, and it'd get all over your eyes and your yeah. face, and it did because it was all made of poison. It would gum? Stick on you forever. No, not me, Mum. No, it's get it in your, your face. hair. Yeah, I know, no. I know, I know. Well, in the days I had hair, it would then. I love it, and you know this. Do you, it, I, I, do you think? I mean, as you're looking through these, I can tell your passion and your. And I know you're always very passionate about uh, about the, the narrative of, of nostalgia. Um, but, of course, now we look at the times we live in, and we don't tend to look at it in any nostalgic fashion whatsoever. But, of course, it is. It is the cars, what goes on, the mobile phones, which you mentioned now and then, because one day we won't be talking into those. We'll be talking into, um, you know, into our arms or something. We'll be chipped. Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe that's what it's all about. Have you had about. your chair? <laughs> <laughs> that's it, yeah. Apple? <laughs> um, but but it is nostalgic at the moment. It's just we don't see it as nostalgic because we're living oh. in it and we're thinking, well, it's not like it used to be in the 70s. Look how great it looked then. But it will look great then, um, uh, now rather, uh, uh, than in the future, if that makes sense. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I've said it a million times, you know, it's – People, benign pictures of today are the powerful pictures of the future. Mm. You know, it's take a picture of your washing line, take a picture of your car, go outside tonight when you listen to this, go and take a picture of your car. Yeah. You might think it's boring now, but in 20 years' time, you look at that picture and you think, I remember that car. Yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. That's, that's the critical thing. And of course, you know, I mean, this this body of work is way more than than, than just snapshots of, for nostalgia. The, you know, there's a real essence of art in this you know the colors especially the collaboration of colors you've got reds and yellows and blues yeah come together a lot in this book primary colors together work really well um but ultimately it's memories you know and and nobody buys it's very uh, i think it's really interesting that like if you went into a photo if you went into a bookshop now today tomorrow and there's a book that says right pictures of malmesbury this year yeah just pictures of the, the the shops you see every day and the people you see every day and then there's a picture of malmesbury uh or, or in your case newbury 50 years ago or, or 30 years ago yeah be more interesting yeah of course because it's it, you know like i said well that's the definition of nostalgia yeah. isn't it it's it's memories so yeah absolutely glasgow by raymond de depardon uh, prefaced by William Boyd. Everybody should go back to their when they get to a certain age. Should go back to their school and ask if they can have a look around and take some pictures. Obviously, you won't be able to do it when kids are there, so it'll have to be during a, a school holiday. But that kind of thing, I. I but why not? It's fascinating. Well, yeah, but because of, there's loads yeah. of pictures of kids in this book. I know loads there are, of them in in playgrounds I, and stuff. I, Some I, of them I, are in their nappies. I know, nobody's but I, nobody's complaining about that. Times have a change, though. Can yeah, you, or you, badly, can't, wrongly, you went can't, wrong somewhere down the line. Anyway, I can't no. go to my school. I build houses and stay <laughs> on it. <laughs> well, there we go. So well, that, that's you know that's a shame, isn't it? If you had pictures of that that school, I went back and. Um, Oh, it would have been about... Well, it was 10 years ago. I went back to my old secondary school and took photographs. I went round the, the school, and, and that was glazed bricks, actually. Proper old sort of... Gla the, the Grange Hill kind of glazed bricks, sort of old Victorian school building. Um, but I found that fascinating. But uh, I actually found that quite a melancholic experience because the school hadn't changed much, but I'd aged... <laughs> 20, 30 years. Yeah, it is interesting. And I, uh, this reminds me of... Um, I, maybe two or three years ago, I can't remember, but I, I typed in my old primary school in, in uh, it was in Betis in Newport, was called St. David Lewis. And I, I, I popped that into Google, you know, just kind of see, I knew that it was no longer there to see what happened. And actually, some guy uh, had, on the day, the last day of the primary school, the last day before they, they you know, closed it down and put houses on it, he'd filmed it all on his little cine camera. Oh. Um, quality is, is, like not great but he's overlaid it with um old kind of children singing catholic yeah. hymns and things like that and Ooh, well, that honest to god yeah. it was it was so powerful because you know he's walking around the playing fields that i played yeah. rugby in he's they, they had logs in the gardens there that we used to jump across i remember the first day i walked down the steps into that school and i remember the last day i walked up those steps in the school uh -huh. and and i remember pretty much everything in between 
you know, I remember Auntie Ella, the dinner lady that used to wipe the tears off our eyes. Was she really I an remember, auntie? Uh, can't, mm, no, not a real auntie. She wasn't a real auntie. We called her Auntie Ella. I, miss, I remember Mrs. Hornsby, who was the, mm. the head teacher all my years. And, you know, I remember Sister St. Joseph, who had the goldfish balls. <laughs> uh, I, I remember Mr. Broderick. He used to pick me up and take me to school in the morning. And sometimes he used to forget and leave me on the bus stop. You know, I remember literally everything. I, I remember Karen, who who was uh, really unwell. I, I remember everything about it. <laughs> Karen, and, and it's unwell. so formative. It it's is so formative. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then they fucking knock it down and stick a whole load of puppy houses on it. But luckily, some 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 guy made a film of made the last film. day, and there's loads of parents who are crying, and you know, teachers are crying and everything really 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 powerful well, i find those sort of i think if, if and there's always places being knocked down that that's a project in itself my um my school friend alistair parker um since we're we're doing memories he his father was um was an administrator at a, a particular hospital just i think in north london and just before that got knocked knocked down or, or to be modernized um, he allowed us to go round that with. Uh, it would have been a Super 8. Would it be a Super 8 uh, Sydney camera? Um, but we we went and did a load of stuff. That must be somewhere. Either Alistair or I've got that somewhere. That'd be quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's nostalgia. That's nostalgia. It, it that's nostalgia. exactly what it is. Went into all the old operating theatres, which they're pretty much left intact because the whole thing was just going to be flawed for new equipment. Everything. Yeah, the wards. It was almost as if people had just walked out. I mean, obviously some stuff had gone, the expensive machines had gone, but everything else was le- was there, just left. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, I can't imagine a, a young Mullins at school. I really can't. Were your eyebrows as large then as they are now? <laughs> bigger. <laughs> Much they? bigger. I used, to, I used to tread on them with my feet. <laughs> oh, oh, dear. Little Mullins. Little Mullins. <laughs> Were you good at school? Were you a good boy? Uh, Were you a troublemaker? Yeah, I think it was all right. Were you all right? I don't okay. think I got into too much trouble. But I do remember, I did once get the cane. I do remember that. Really? Yeah, that you, hurt. You don't come from a generation where you could have been caned, surely. <laughs> I do. No. <laughs> I did. Really? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It was my own fault, in fairness. Oh. I did throw a, a, a one. You remember those rulers that you used to get rulers, uh, Schaefer rulers that were, they say, shatterproof, and you bend them, and then they oh, would yeah. snap, so they yeah. weren't shatterproof. No. And then you get wooden rulers. <laughs> Which make interesting boing noises. <laughs> yeah, especially uh, through one at a teacher's head. <gasps> but I wasn't aiming for her. I was aiming for Gareth Davis. He, he moved, and then this teacher walked in behind him, and it hit her in the head. Yeah, it wasn't my fault. Likely story. I wouldn't have bought <laughs> that either. Yeah, come here, Mullins. Six of the best. <laughs> <laughs> right uh, so the book is so the we we've sort of come away from the book but we did go down this rabbit hole of nostalgia which was wonderful um yeah. the, bu- the book is called glasgow raymond depardon wonderful brilliant yeah and on actually, amazon get it yeah you must buy it it's, it's beautiful it's, and of course we always link to these things i yeah. keep saying get it on amazon we always link to it on a uh Fujicast page yeah and it's not too expensive this one no no no. it's about 15 quid i know no. yeah this the first edition I think is probably a little bit rarer. There was two editions, 2015, 2016. Um, I, the one I've got is 2016. I've got the reprint. Yeah. So I think the first edition might be a little bit more pricey, but the second edition doesn't matter. It's all about the pictures. Just, just beautiful. Right. Here's a question from, oh, we should have bumped this one to the front, actually. Uh, Stephen Deca, um, who said, I tend to keep white balance on auto on my X-T3. How often do you go off auto and in what conditions? Thanks for everything. And yeah, he's added a yada, yada, yada on the end. Um, auto balance. I'm pretty faithful to auto balance. Don't come away from it very often at all, actually. Only when I'm filming. If I'm doing filming, I take off auto white balance. I set that manually. But yeah, stills always. Can't can't. No. Think the last time. Yeah, I mean studio work. I've done a little bit of it recently, and yes, I'm going to set my my white balance accordingly then. But yes, like general photography. Mm. Auto white balance, yeah. Well, that one was easily solved. Go on, Kev. I've got one from John Almont, and he says, oddly, why is camera gear usually sold in non-sealed boxes? <laughs> <laughs> Back on boxes. <laughs> <laughs> why would you like them sealed up? Why would you, why would you want them sealed up? Well, you know the thing about boxes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. little boxes. Uh, yes, so um, of course. He is taking a little bit of a mickey, but the um, you do I, I do sometimes get stuff from Amazon and things like that, and it, it's clearly in a box that's been opened before. Yeah, you think hmm, that's a return, but uh, yeah. Right, um, here's one from Patrick Connor. 
a right royal camera is the subject to, to this this question, and, and, and not so much a question, but what, what's coming up. I know you know what I'm I'm talking about here, Kev, because when I saw it last um, last weekend, I thought, oh, do you know what? There there is you just, money can't buy that kind of product placement. It really can't. Hello, chaps. I was watching the news, and there was a piece about the uh, Duchess of um, of Cambridge curating a collection of uh, COVID-related images. To illustrate the story, they showed a picture of Kate holding a Fujifilm camera. Hard to see the exact model, but it was either an X-T3 or X-T30. It was a 3, wasn't it? I think, I think it was X-T3, yeah. yeah. It looks well used, so clearly it's what she uses to shoot her family photos of Princes George and Louis and their sister Princess Charlotte. Um, as an owner of several Fujifilm cameras, it's nice to know I'm in such regal company. Yes, Patrick, it is. I wonder if Andreas knows. Uh, I, I think so. I, I did. Think he probably I, does. <laughs> I, I saw instantly there were lots of um, lots of little messages that were tagging him in. Mm. Who wants to be the first to tell Andreas? <laughs> <laughs> I suspect he probably knew. Yeah, it was interesting, wasn't it? I mean, I think she's a lovely photographer, and she's she's got a book coming out, hasn't she? Yeah. It's kind of a lockdown life. I think that's um, yeah, yeah that's, that's great. Good for her. Yeah, but well, I mean, that is just the possibly the best advertising you could ever get, isn't it? Really, and Prince William. Hey, also, there's hey. been pictures of him in the past, and also Prince Harry with X one hundreds. Yeah, uh, Harry when he was in uh, Afghanistan, I think military. Um, is pictures of him with the X100, but uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it is that is the best marketing you can get, isn't it? I know, I know. Um, right, go on, Kev. Have you got? I think we, we must be close to the last last question, but go on, your one. Right, I've got a quick question from Jamie Gonzalez. Uh, he says, Howdy, gents. Could they, would they, should they put a wireless flash controller in cameras? Is the internal, uh, i.e., the internal version of the Godex X Pro baked into a camera? Imagine that. Well, Kev would love that for a start. <laughs> Great. Yeah, that'd be another little button for me to turn off. <laughs> <laughs> Although you are doing more flash work now. You've, you've, uh, yeah. Well, well, it's not flash, but it's, it's solid state. But no, absolutely. Actually, yeah, I mean, no, of course, yeah, I, just because yeah. I don't use it doesn't mean it's not useful. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, we were just talking about this whole idea of 5G and where they're going to go next. Yeah, I mean, why not? That that sounds like a pretty sensible thing, really. Why I suppose the problem being that, that you have different uh, protocols, right. different flash systems, yeah. and some of them use infrared, some of them use wireless, some yeah. of them use the old PC sync cables, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, if they could all kind of, um, you know, all use the same stuff, then why not? Yeah, yeah that sounds yeah, like a you're great right idea. Though, actually, because they don't all speak the same language, do they? And that's your problem. Mm. But uh, yeah, that wouldn't be a bad idea at all. But, and, and, and that is it on that note. Into the good ideas file for the We Shall Consider. Um, <laughs> we Shall Consider. Reply. And that's it for another week. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you uh, to John Manell, our guest today. Um, see you in the Facebook group for any questions you have about today's show. Play nice. Uh, Steve and Peter are in there as well, just to uh, to make sure nobody needs a yellow card. Uh, send your questions. Um, we do need them to uh, click at fujicast.co.uk or indeed you can send them uh, via the, the Facebook. I know not everybody uses Facebook, but if you do, and it's become very popular leaving questions, hasn't it, Kev? Yeah, I think it's good. But yes, yeah. send some to the, the email address as well. Yes, oh, we good. Didn't, we, didn't, we like to feel loved. Yes. <laughs> didn't mention the, the Prince Ooh. Swap. Prince Swap. Yes, Prince Swap. correct. We didn't. Do you want to mention it now? Because we've got plenty of the theme tune to go. Yes. Uh, uh, hashtag Fujicast Print Swap on Instagram. We've got a few more weeks left. Uh, we've now got something like 130 odd pictures. I will curate it. I will try my damnedest best to, to stick people geographically together. And uh, yeah, it's great. Put put your picture in, and uh, we'll swap you with somebody else, and you send them a picture, and they'll send you a picture. But it has to be print. I, I've um, actually got a print from the print swap already. Now, I, and I didn't swap yeah, a you. print. Yeah. No. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure. He he did say I didn't have to mention. He requested that I don't mention him. Well, I don't know. I might I might actually say something about it next week. Because, um, because I want to say something about the photograph, which is not in front of me at the moment. Anyway, um, so yes, join in with that. Thank you to those who are supporting the show by Patreon. Music from Blue Wednesday, supporting music from the incredible artlist.io. And if you want to see any of the links today, go to fujicast.co.uk. We'll see you next week. Don't eat too much chocolate. <laughs> Promise me you won't take the stuff from the kids. <laughs> That's last week. <laughs> 
Yeah, no. <laughs> no, it's Easter Monday today, officially by the show. You should not have eaten all that supply of chocolate yet, surely. Or will you have done? Yeah, definitely. Oh, God. See you next week, Kev. Bye-bye. Bye. The Fujicast is an independent Loading Zone production. Email the show with your questions and words of wisdom to click at fujicast.co.uk. Email any complaints and political nonsense to our wives who will deal with your comments in their own good time and in their own good way.